This is a KGov special presentation. Full committee will come to order. This field hearing is on pathways to energy in independence and particularly on hydraulic fracturing and other new technologies. The oversight, <coughs> excuse me, the oversight committee's mission, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission, and this is what we are here for today. This weekend, national gas prices surpassed $4 a gallon. That's no surprise to the people of California, who are tiptoeing on high test toward $5. A number of factors are included in this. Our committee will, in fact, look at all of them. Let there be no mistake, today is not about only one part of the cost of natural gas, oil, and other uh, sources of energy. Consumption from China and India are rising, thus stressing a world that had a norm of supplying mostly Europe and the United States with its fuel. Many of the uh, wells that produce oil and natural gas have been operating for decades or even here 100 years. Here in Bakersfield, we discover an early a uh, set of wells that still produce and can produce much more. We're here today to talk about, and or sorry, to talk and listen to experts who can help us understand how we can safely extract more, not less, energy from this region. It is very clear that America suffers from a willingness to buy, a willingness to consume, but not nearly enough willingness to produce domestically. Hydraulic, hydraulic fracturing or fracking is largely responsible for increase in natural gas production. The proven technology has revolutionized the extraction business, particularly in natural gas. But let us make it very clear, hydraulic fracturing or fracking is not new. It is the improvements in a 60-year-old technology that we are so interested in. In North Dakota, we have a stunning example where horizontal fracking for oil production has increased 7,500 percent in just five years. Pennsylvania, one of the areas first used for oil, has the same potential as does California. But to recognize that potential, we are going to have to listen to all the concerned citizens. We are going to have to recognize that in America today, there are safe ways to do things, and then there are shortcuts. Our committee is interested in making sure that no industry ever again takes shortcuts, as we believe occurred in the Gulf. At the same time, oil and natural gas will be produced somewhere in the world to meet our consumption needs. Our goal is to make sure that the safest possible activity goes on in the U.S. and the maximum amount that can be extracted is extracted safely. America has the highest standards for drinking water. EPA is to be commended for what they've done on it. At the same time, clean water without, in fact, an economy operating are mutually exclusive. Most of what we do in the way of clean air, clean water, are the result of a vibrant economy that is able to support technologies that make these, uh, these clean air and clean water more available and more abundant, not just here, but around the world. So as we look at this issue today, let me make it clear, we will be looking at the entire group of issues, including ways in which we can produce more 
and consume less. President Obama has set goals for increased production and increased safety. We, as one half of one third of the government, seek to make sure that his goals of clean, safe, and abundance of American fuel is able to be met by his administration through the work of this Congress and oversight. Before I recognize other members for the opening statements, I would like to, uh, uh, to add one more thing for the record. Uh, I'll be including uh, the comment of the committee on the announcement of uh, the President's fracking advisory panel. Secretary Chu has appointed a panel. We've reviewed it. Uh, I guess I'll ask any of you here about it in time to uh, be included in that commission. No. From what we can find, this is a commission that lacks operators. It lacks people with experience in the production and appears to be a combination of, if you will, intellectuals and opponents of all natural gas, oil, and other fossil fuel production. So we're hoping through this letter in the record and a, a follow-up to the administration that this commission can be expanded so that its consensus is a consensus of the entire industry and, and beneficiaries and not simply those who have already decided they don't want the end product. And with that, I would recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Uh, Fahrenthold, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm. Uh Honored to be here today in California, another great oil producing state as I uh, drove in last night. There's uh, another? <laughs> yes, there is. As, as I drove in last night, I, I looked around and uh, kind of smelt the air and got the uh, feeling of, uh, uh, of the community. When you go into a town, there's just kind of a, a, a vibrancy or a feeling you get. And I was commenting to uh, Jessica Blake, who was with me, a member of my staff, who actually grew up in Middleton, or Midland, Texas, and we both agreed, wow, this is West Texas with some mountains in the background and a few degrees cooler. So I, I, I'm... I'm honored to be here and I feel right at home. We have created a uh, situation in this country where gas pri gasoline prices are so high that it's affecting every area of our economy. The food that we eat, every good or service that we purchase is affected by the increasing cost of uh, gasoline and the increasing costs of energy. We are producing, uh, we are importing the bulk of our oil and gas from foreign countries, uh, many of whom are not uh, our friend. Uh, energy independence, uh, increased domestic uh, oil and gas production is an important economic issue, it's an important jobs issue, and it is also an important national security issue. So I would like to uh, thank our panel here for taking the time to uh, come talk to us and uh, let us explore uh, and understand better the technologies that have been use, in use for over 60 years safely for increasing oil and gas production here in California, at home in Texas, and now throughout the United States of America. Uh, I look forward to the testimony, look forward to uh, asking some questions uh, to the uh, witnesses, and uh, would also like to uh, thank Mr. McCarthy and Mr. Issa for having me here. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and it now gives me great pleasure to recognize uh, your hometown hero, one of my heroes, someone who I knew when he was in leadership uh, in the State House and uh, was pleased when he came to Congress, and even pleased when he passed me by uh, to uh, be one of the top ranking members of uh, Republican leadership. So uh, I'm the chairman, but Kevin McCarthy is the boss. I yield to the gentleman from California. Uh, that, that was very kind. Um, I do want to thank uh, Chairman Issa. He's been going up and down throughout the nation. Um, Kern County is not new to him. He's been throughout here. But the work that he's done through his committee, uh, his committee is government house oversight. And for too long, government has not had the oversight. Um, we have passed a lot of different pieces of legislation, but we've never gone back and had the accountability. And his is the one committee that brings the accountability back to government, and he's done an extraordinary job with it so far. And the one thing I want to thank him is coming to the 22nd Congressional District. And when you look at the challenges, what Blake talked about, the security of America from jobs, from uh, the ability 
to have energy independence, there's probably no better district in the nation than the 22nd District. We go from the Mojave Desert to the Pacific Ocean. You have the fourth largest potential in wind, in the nation, fourth largest in the state for solar. You can go a cross, you can find a nuclear facility in San Luis Obispo. You go up to find geothermal in Ridgecrest. But as Kern County knows, we produce more than 70% of all the oil in California. 10% of the nation, 1% of the world. It's more than 100 years. So the technology has to be different. But as technology has changed our life, as I look across into this field of individuals, they all have different forms of cameras. When we landed on the Apollo, uh, with the Apollo landing on the moon, there's more technology in my Blackberry today than there was on the Apollo. It has made our life better. And just as that technology has improved, it has improved our ability to use the resources of America instead of paying someone else for it. When we send our money someplace else, we send our jobs someplace else, but we also constrain our economy. Now, we are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, but do we have the ability to bring it up? We've watched fields more than 100 years old, and there are independent representatives here in the oil business that many have sold them and moved on. We find in Kern County you have Oxy as based here. Well, government sold them their field for three billion and they thought they've got a really good deal at it because they didn't think anything would extract. And one of the largest finds um, undiscovered in the last little bit is out there. So there is new potential each and every day. Our decision has to be, as Americans, do we want to control our own future? Do we want to invest in America? And do we want to use that technology so we protect our environment at the same time and make it better than we're using it today? I mean, it's almost every week I'm able to go out and see a new form. In Kern County, our oil happens to be thicker, so we have to enhance it to get it even to come up. Well, we have now used new technology where we have first in the world putting a solar panels out there to put the steam in. It is a new approach, a new style, and that's what we believe in. America reaching the new opportunities. Now look, Winston Churchill always said about America, you can always count on them to do what's right after they exhausted every other option. And I think that's right when you look at our energy policies. We put an energy department because we wanted to become energy independent. We import more today than when we created that department. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have the resources in America. We have the ability. If we make the decision that we do not want to utilize our natural resources, that doesn't mean we're not going to get it from somewhere else. That just means we're going to pay somebody else. Somebody else is going to have the jobs, and it's going to cost our own economy. And we've watched that, and we watched the world continue to grow. So that's what today's hearing is about. That we want to protect our environment. We want to do it in a common sense, sound way that makes the investment right here. And we want to utilize the technology that allows us to do it. It's a little ironic that the chairman of this uh, committee probably knows technology better than anybody else inside uh, Congress. He was very successful in business based upon technology, and he continues to enhance that ability and apply that. But also, he understands accountability, and that's what he wants to apply to government as well. That's why he goes out across the country and has a hearing and goes directly to where it can have an effect. So I want to thank the chairman, I want to thank the committee, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Just another reminder of how he got to be the third highest ranking Republican in half the time that I've been in Congress. Uh, we now recognize our panel of distinguished witnesses. Assemblywoman Shannon Grove represents the 32nd District of California and is also an entrepreneur and a, a very successful one at that. Rock Zeman? Zimmerman. Why does they got it wrong? Sorry about that, Rock. Uh, is, Chief Executive Officer of the California Independent Petroleum Association, Dr. William H. Weissif, Weissif is Executive Vice President of Devon Energy, uh, which is the largest U.S.-based independent oil and gas producer, and as I was reminded, both a Californian and an Oklahoman, depending, and we, we miss you here. Uh, Mr. Steve Layton is President of ENB Natural Resource Management Corporation of California based, a California based independent oil and natural gas exploration company. Thank you for being here. And uh, Mr. Is it Tupper? 
Hull is Vice President of the Western States Petroleum Association, which represents uh, large and medium oil producers and uh, a frequent testifier on these kinds of important issues. Pursuant to the Committee's rules, I would ask you all to rise to take uh, an oath. Please raise your right arm hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. This is a field hearing, and although many of you have seen in Washington in the past uh, understand the formality of Washington, it's a little different here. You're not going to see adversarial questions and can we get you in 20 questions and cut you off as you're answering. Anyone that comes to a field hearing, Republican or Democrat, generally comes to listen. So although we would like you to try to stick to more or less five minutes because your entire opening statements are going to be placed in the record, as we go through the questioning, uh, don't be surprised if Blake comes in and says a follow-up to what I say or Kevin comes in. The idea is we're here to listen, we're here to learn. And at the same time, if one is answering and you want to pipe in, don't wait to be asked. We want to make the record complete with the knowledge that you bring to us to take back to Washington. And uh, with that, Mrs. Grove, or Ms. Grove, I will uh, recognize you first, mostly because you're first on the schedule, but also because you're the, the lady present. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Congressman McCarthy and members and guests. Um, I'm Assemblywoman Shannon Grove, but before I became elected to the, serve the people of Kern County, I've been a business owner. And um, my business is a primarily a third or fourth tier contractor to the oil construction and agricultural industries. And my hope here today is to bring some common sense regarding our domestic oil production. For these two very important reasons, the security of our nation and jobs, we have a vast supply of fossil fuels, oil, in California, and we barely are tapping into them. Think about this, for every barrel of oil that we cannot produce here, we are importing from a volatile foreign nation. Most of it comes from volatile foreign nations. Why are we as Americans relying so much on energy from foreign nations when we have the ability, the technology, and the people who need jobs in our own state, our own county, and our own nation right here able to do it? For example, I know one smaller kind of mid-sized producer that has a platform, and if allowed, this platform can produce an additional 30,000 barrels of oil a day. So if you think about that and you're conservative, if we were allowed to produce 100,000 barrels of oil a day additional to what we produce now, California could reduce 20 percent, or excuse me, increase 20 percent of its oil um, increase, and you would reduce that um, from the Middle East uh, or countries. Equally important is our national security or jobs, private sector, non-taxpayer funded jobs. Our nation has one of the highest unemployment rates um, ever, and here in our energy-rich district I, that I represent, it's at an all-time high of 17.5% unemployment. Some of our Kern County cities are close to 40% unemployment, and that's completely unnecessary. Jobs domestic oil production would produce are great paying, high quality, non-taxpayer funded, much needed jobs. So with over two million people out of work in our great state and more across the nation, our national security and our econo economic hope of the future must realize its potential that we are leaving in the ground. Allowing increased domestic oil production begins to solve both of these very important issues, our national security and private sector jobs that are much needed in our, in our nation. Let the people of the United States and California get back to work, reduce our dependency on foreign oil, and make America stronger. And stop this full out assault that we have on a very prosperous industry that provides jobs in our nation. It's the number one thing that we need. People need to get back to work. And this industry provides jobs and has provided jobs and technology throughout history. So thank you for letting me be a part of this today, and I'll keep my opening remarks brief. That's very unwashington like. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zimmerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Rock Zimmerman, uh, CEO of the California Independent Petroleum Association. Uh, we're a trade association that represents about 470 uh, companies, uh, independent oil and producer uh, companies, royalty owners, and service and supply companies that have operations here in California. About 160 of those are actual oil and gas producers. 
uh, that range in size from small producers with just a couple of wells to large multinational uh, corporations that produce hundreds of thousands. The definition of an independent uh, doesn't have to do with size. It has to do with the fact that they're not an integrated company. They don't refine, market, tr transport uh, petroleum products is, at all. Independent producers produce 70 percent of California's in-state production of oil and 90 percent of its natural gas. As a state, our in-state production uh, represents 38 percent of what we consume, our refineries and our consumers, uh, and uh, on, the, uh, on the oil side. Uh, the rest, as uh, Ms. Grove uh, mentioned, has to be tankered in. And 14 percent comes from Alaska, but they're also uh, declining. And so the rest of the marginal wells have to come from foreign countries, primarily Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Ecuador. Um, Independents are the main driving force behind exploring for new oil and natural gas reserves. Uh, over 90 percent of domestic oil and gas wells are drilled by independents in the United States, and their role is increasing. In 1999, major oil companies invested $31 billion in new drilling programs, while independents invested $18 billion. By 2007, the role had totally reversed. Majors invested $49 billion and independents $77 billion for a total of $126 billion. And that was four years ago. Obviously, the numbers are quite larger today, which leads us to the next point, which is drilling for oil and natural gas is expensive, and it's getting more expensive. Uh, in 1999, it cost $100 per foot on average to drill a well in the United States. By 2008, that had risen sixfold to uh, $600 a foot. A recent study concluded that, on average, independents reinvest 150 percent of their net income back into drilling operations. That means they have to go out and get equity partners with capital or they have to borrow from banks um, in order to continue their operations. Capital budgets, by definition, are driven by in how much capital is available. And obviously, the market price of oil plays a significant role in determining how much capital is available. But other factors, uh, such as risk, and return on investment also contribute. Oil and gas operations, as with all mining operations, are producing a finite resource. Therefore, producers are basically going out of business every day. So in order to survive, producers have to drill to find new resources or employ new technology to better extract existing oil fields, uh, and that takes money. So if your goal is to increase domestic oil and gas production, you can't hamper the availability of capital. And unfortunately, that's uh, precisely what the administration has proposed in their last three budgets. Um, the administration claims that big oil is receiving subsidies from the U.S. government, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I've listed a number in the record of these uh, tax treatments, and I'll just mention two. One is intangible drilling costs, which, by the way, are not available to any of the integrated majors, only to independents. And these are expenses, expensing of um, non-salvageable uh, non items that can be expensed in the current year. Um, that they were incurred, just like every other business can. If a shoe salesman buys shoe for $10 and sells it for 20 he doesn't depreciate the shoe over seven years. He expenses it. So these debates are about the proper, proper accounting method of expensing uh, these things. These are not subsidies that are given uh, cash payments from the government for a certain activity. And as I mentioned, a lot of the other ones are listed in the record. I'd be happy to address them uh, with any questions. But the bottom line is it takes a lot of capital uh, to drill for new oil and gas production. So let's not hamper the access to this capital by raising taxes on our domestic uh, independent producers. Let's let the sector continue to create jobs and meet the energy needs of our citizens. Today they employ about 4 million people, re which represents over 3 percent of our total U.S. workforce. And that's what we need to foster in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, they've, they've all been running under time. Uh, so there's extra time if you need That's it. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to uh, members of the uh, committee for the opportunity today. And I want to thank the local residents with whom I had a great conversation uh, before the meeting today, and, and they had a number of good questions. What I'd like to do is, is chat a little bit with you and discuss what is truly a revol revolution caused by technology. The chairman alluded to it. And this is the natural gas revolution in the country today. The game has changed. The revolution is here. The paradigm has shifted, and there is no going back. This is a piece of shale from 8,000 feet below the prairie of Oklahoma, and I'd like to pass this around to the committee, and also uh, it's fine to pass it around to the audience, too. The natural gas is actually trapped in the pores of this core sample, 
And this is the key to the revolution. What I'd like to do is start with a little geology lesson here. This is geology for non-geologists. You can follow either in the printed testimony or on the screen. But traditionally, we were looking for oil and gas that was um, produced in that lower band, the gray area there, source rocks. These are shales that I'm referring to here. And that oil and gas uh, cooked for 340 million years, uh, little critters and plants, uh, would migrate through porous uh, uh, zones up until they were trapped by an impermeable layer of rock. And you can see that shown there toward the right in the, the small red area. Well, that led us to find or try to find a number of these little trapped areas, and that's why you had uh, so many wildcat wells that were less successful or more. And then uh, back in the, uh, in the 1990s, uh, beginning in Texas, and I'll have more to say about that, George Mitchell had the idea that we ought to be able to produce natural gas right from the source rock. And he started uh, drilling vertical wells and, and, and uh, fracturing them, and the economics just didn't work out all that well. So in 2002, uh, Devon Energy that acquired Mitchell began to marry the technologies of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling to begin to produce gas from the Barnett Shale of Texas. That's a picture of where it is. We'll go to the next slide, and um, you'll see that uh, in the uh, early part of last decade, the uh, wells were shown on the black line. Those were vertical wells. You can see production rates and, and the production tailing off out into the future. And then look what happened with the blue line there when we started marrying the hydraulic fracturing and the, uh, the hydraulic fracturing uh, to produce this gas. Huge initial production rates, and these wells may last 40 or 50 years. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you can see the history of these shale plays around the country with the use of this marriage of technology. And you can go to the next slide to see the projections that EIA has in the dark blue there for our gas resource production into the future based on this, this technology. This is a depiction of the areas around the country where we have uh, shale fairways and, and the ability potentially to produce a lot more natural gas for this country. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that that has already begun to have a very significant uh, positive effect on consumer prices. Those are three different projections by the EIA over the past three years, ending up with that red line on the bottom that show the different price projections based on this increased supply. And if you go past this slide to hydraulic fracturing, this is what I'd like to spend a little more time on. Hydraulic fracturing is, of course, the putting of large quantities of water, sand, into the ground, pulling the water out, the sand, holding the fractures open. And we have a little uh, bit of animation here that will show you uh, what it is that we're doing. First of all, um, we uh, drill the well, and then we're going to rerun it from the beginning here, hopefully. Um, and you'll see that the well is drilled, obviously, from uh, the surface out into a lateral that can be many thousands of feet long. And uh, then once we complete the drilling of the well, I'll tell you what, I'm not sure that that's going to work so well, but we'll just uh, talk about it from here. Um, you can see that, that the, the drill string is pulled out, and then the well is actually uh, perforated uh, with a perf gun. You see that happening here into the shale formation. And after the well is uh, perforated, to, you can see the, the length of the distance of the perforations. Then the sand and water with some additives is put in under very high pressure, and we begin to frack the, the shale formation. The um, uh, frack stages can be multiple. Here we put a plug, and then we'll come back into the well and do the same kind of fracture stimulation treatment along that horizontal part of the well. And then the water and, uh, uh, is flowed out. The sand stays holding the, uh, the fractures open. And the surface equipment is, by and large, removed, and only a small amount remaining in the gas is produced. So that's basically the hydraulic fracturing process. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that one of the big concerns about hydraulic fracturing is addressed here by our well construction. We, uh, under state regulation throughout the country, um, put pipe, or what we call casing, through any fresh water zones that usually occur hundreds of feet below the surface, and we may be fracking as much as 15,000 feet below the surface, but we seal off the water zones before we start the operation, and you can see that depicted here. 
If you go to the next slide, you'll see just a, a depiction of the equipment that's used on a site. That equipment virtually all goes away after the frack job. And uh, you see some numbers there with regard to the amount of water we use. We can talk about that later. If you look at the frack fluid components that have gotten a lot of attention recently, uh, the bottom line is that uh,